Let's start off out in Atlanta. Which coach has the most to prove in 2024 that isn't on the hot seat? Dave, this is going to be really interesting because I think that there's going to be people who think he is on the hot seat, but Dabo Sweeney comes to mind first. Dabo still is Dabo. And I think when you talk about his legacy and what he's done for the game of college football, it knows no limits. And I think that the other part that's really important here is understanding that what Dabo did during his tenure when Clemson was at its peak might be just as impressive as what we've seen from guys like Urban Meyer in Ohio State. Partially, you can go with that Orger on LSU. You can probably go Kirby Smart going toe-to-toe with Nick Saban down in Athens, Georgia. This is a guy that was able to revamp a program that had high standings back in the 80s and the early 90s and did so as an interim coach. This was not a guy that was expected to be the front runner for the job. He was a wide receivers coach and a run game coordinator when he took over in 2010. And then eventually there was conversations that he was going to be shown the door and he started to win games. They got to 10 win seasons and he did the improbable by getting up to the rankings and the recruiting style alongside Alabama and LSU and Georgia. And then they won national championships and they did so in erratic fashion by beating up against Ohio State, beating up against Notre Dame, going toe-to-toe with Alabama, going toe-to-toe with Georgia, with Kirby. They went down to the wire and were able to best teams in a route to winning titles. But change is inevitable in the sport. We all know it. And it's why you've seen really good coaches be shown the door because of it's passed them by. They weren't willing to adapt to the new style. And then Nick Saban retires and you lose Jimbo Fisher. And now there's only three coaches that are active with actually national titles attached to their name. Dabo's one of them. And one thing that's going to be really important here is that Dabo isn't changing his ways. He is true to his Southern style. And more importantly, he is authentic as all hell. Who he is, is exactly how he portrays himself inside that locker room. It's how recruits meet him. It's the way that parents meet him. It's the way that he deals with boosters. So he's not changing the way that he wants to go about the transfer portal just because of that's the new norm in the sport. Okay, so now you got to find a way to win. Now you have to find a way to show, yes, you of all people are going to be able to turn the ship in your direction. You of all people are going to be able to mitigate the waters and find your path to success. Because as long as you're doing that, we really don't care. We're Clemson. We believe that we can be a 10-win roster, go to the college football playoff, and probably go toe-to-toe with anybody that we go up against on a Saturday. But if you don't start to see the fruits of your labor actually unfold, and they got some good players, TJ Moore, uh, Brian Wesco coming on in at wide receiver, another year with Kate Klubnick working in this offense led by Garrett Riley. There's a lot of potential for this team in Clemson. But If things don't go his way, if things start to go a little bit south, and there is a conversation, you have to make these changes. And he says, no, I do it my way or the highway. The highway is going to look pretty wide open for Dabo to have an opportunity elsewhere. And even then, he may not want to coach anywhere else but Clemson. I think Lincoln Riley faces a little bit of pressure too. And it's not because of he hasn't made changes. In fact, you can make the case that humbling himself this past offseason was the biggest blessing in disguise. Gets rid of his best friend and Alex Grinch's defensive coordinator finally brings in a legit name that is going to demand excellence in practice with DeAnse and Lynn coming on over from UCLA. But also, they have to show that they are more than just capable of winning with passing. Like, the one thing that really stood out to me about Ohio State a few years ago was Ryan Day's offense would go toe-to-toe with anybody. He'd be able to sling it around the yard. He'd be able to get easy points. Nobody was going to be able to stop the passing attack. But they were able to go ahead and bully them in the trenches. They were able to run all over them defensively. And so because of that, you start to see changes being made. Go and fix the new offensive line coach. They go bring in Jim Knowles from Oklahoma State. And slowly but surely, now this becomes a program that looks like it is at its peak. There are no flaws in Columbus. There are no question marks on the offensive line or on the defensive line. Nobody's questioning the physicality of what you can expect at Ohio Stadium. And you also still have that offense that's really high potent and go score a lot of points. So to me, the reason why this is a big deal for Lincoln Riley has nothing to do with the offensive identity. We know that he's going to sling it. We know that his offense is going to be potent. We know that his quarterbacks are going to be hell-bent on putting up a lot of points and making life easy for the Trojans. But are they physically ready to take on what is going to be the Big Ten? Because I'm not talking about Penn State and Ohio State and even Michigan for that matter. I'm talking about Minnesota, Nebraska, Michigan State, 
Those are schools that have bullies in the trenches that are willing to physically annihilate you on a Saturday and make you scream uncle. Do you have the talent that's going to be able to combat that? And more specifically, going into this season, will you be able to show where the flaws are? That way you don't find yourself back in the situation going into year uh, going into year two in the Big Ten. So it's a lot about setting a standard for USC, in my opinion. Not more so about what should be the eventual future that is Lincoln Riley out in the West Coast, Best Coast. Last one. I think Marcus Freeman faces pressure. And I don't think it's because if he doesn't know what he's doing, he's shown you that he has got this program trending in the right direction on all the areas outside of the game of football. NIL starting to be bolstering in a lot of different ways. You also have the transfer portal. Players are coming to Notre Dame, the recruiting trail. Yes, Notre Dame has always been a middle-tier program when it comes to recruiting. They've been good, solid, sturdy. Now, they're actually getting alongside the LSUs of the world. They're getting alongside the Texas of the world. They're getting alongside the Ohio States. They're bringing in players that not only have the grades, but also view South Bend, Indiana, as a place of not just a safe haven, but also one where we can win. But that's where the winning comes in. You're not going to have a conference title game, so you don't have that blessing of getting a first-round bye. You also don't play in a conference, so while you do have tougher matchups where every game is out of conference, you also have to realize that if you go 9-3, and three, if you go 10-2, and two, you're not guaranteed a spot in the postseason like maybe someone from the SEC is someone for the Big Ten is, or maybe even a Big 12 team or an ACC team that just lost on a game-winning field goal to maybe Georgia, like Clemson goes down to the wire and they lose one game to NC State, and then they lose to Ohio, and then they lose to Georgia week one. There's an argument that, well, that game against Georgia carries more weight than any game for Notre Dame. And to me, this is all about just showing that you are actually going to be a player in the playoffs because there's a reason to believe that Notre Dame belongs in that conversation, at least when it comes to the style of brand that we know. The ratings are going to go through the roof when it comes to Notre Dame. People will watch the Irish just to see them lose. There is this weird phenomenon all in college football where fan bases just love to all bully on one individual. And Notre Dame is at the top of that list. I think Texas A&M and the SEC certainly is on that list. I think Ohio State's on that list for some people. But they just love to watch the team squirm and falter and fall apart down the stretch to where you're going to get Notre Dame in the playoffs. Miami's one that makes sense like this. Like the U's not back, and yet people are ready to go ahead and crap all over them because of they're expected to have a good year. Until you see it, until you prove that, yes, just because if we play it out of conference schedule, that doesn't mean that we're not good enough to be alongside everybody else. So those three coaches, I think Dabo's got a lot to prove this year when it comes to his brand of football and his ideology still working. Lincoln Riley just showing physically we are good enough to be alongside those in the Big Ten. And Marcus Freeman, not really has anything to do with his coaching style or demeanor. More so just, yeah, we are going to be a team that actually can go to the postseason. And also, we kind of deserve a spot in the postseason. Now Hey, you made it to the end of the video. That's awesome. Thank you so much. But before you leave, make sure that you hit subscribe. And if you want to check out any of our other great work, make sure you click on one of the videos here. Am I putting it in the right spot? I, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm really not.